Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. And today, we're finishing up our two-part mini-series entitled, Dying to Self. Today's message is, it's not about us. Because truly, it's not about us. It doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what we believe. It doesn't even matter what we want to happen. It is everything will happen all according to God's good pleasure. And the good thing about that is that God's good pleasure includes us and our good. He wants what's best for us. We are always on his mind. If we deny ourselves, it will give him an opportunity to do good things for us. But if we exalt ourselves, we will only be debased. It's the law of self-promotion. He who promotes himself will be abased. Turn with me, please, to our scripture, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 8. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not look into your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Last time, we discussed the first two verses of the scripture, verse 3 and 4. But today, we will discuss the rest of that scripture, starting with verse 5, which affects our relationship with each other. Paul said in verses 5 and 6, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Paul said, we ought always to have this mindset. Which mindset? The same mindset that Christ Jesus had, who was God, who still is God, but did not use his position as God to his own advantage. We live in a world that it's all about titles, it's all about positions, it's all about strength, it's all about power. We are taught in school that only the strong survive, and that has carried on or carried over into our regular lives. I was listening to a partial lecture by Jordan Peterson, and he was talking about why zebras have stripes. He said, it's not because of camouflage. He said that the lions have camouflage, and they are golden, and they blend in with their surroundings. But zebras, zebras on the other hand, they're black and white, and they stand out from on, on, on the plane, they, they, you can see them for at least five miles away. You can immediately spot a herd of zebras out there on, on the savannah. But it is not so easy to spot a single specific individual zebra in that herd because they all blend in with each other. Then he explains that that's their camouflage and it's effective, but it actually works against the herd. But nevertheless, it still works. It all works in their favor because not even flies like the stripes, he says. Likewise, the lions, they need to identify a specific zebra. They need to focus on one zebra before the hunt can begin because obviously they can't hunt the whole herd. They have to have one individual to focus on. 
They need to identify some feature to focus on that they can, will, will not be confused by the black and white mass that is in front of them. So he says, okay, what do you suppose will happen if a scientist goes up to one of those zebras and paints a big red dot on the side of that zebra so that they can more easily identify it from the rest of the herd? Then he goes on, he explains that what will happen is the lions will immediately kill and eat that zebra because of the identifying features which separate that one zebra from the rest of the black and white herd. The moral of the story is not just the strong survives, but it is the identifying features or features that separate the one from the rest of the herd, such as a limp or a clipped ear or a shorter leg than all the rest. Or maybe it's the one that's lagging behind, but something is different. Something has caught their attention, something for them to focus on. I suppose it's like a crowd who will focus on the one and target the one, the one that is different, the one that is not a part of the herd. See, it all boils down to this. It is those who that are different who are eliminated. In other words, we Christians, we are different. We are a peculiar people. We live in a place that is not ours. Although we live in the world, we do not belong to the world. We have our citizenship somewhere else. See, we Christians walk around with a target on our backs. We are the ones that are different. We are Christians that stand out like a sore thumb. We are focused on. We are targeted. Yet, in all of that, we must not and cannot retaliate. Nor can we return railing for railing, nor cursing for cursing. But we must bless when we're cursed. We must love even when we're hated. Paul said for us, it is not about the strong surviving. It's not about titles, but rather it's all about God and our relationship with him and our relationship with each other. We are not to think more of ourselves than we ought. Just because you are the big boss does not mean that you're to lord it over all of your employees. Nor just because you're stronger than someone else or others does not mean that you must master, be master over that individual or individuals. But rather, in order to be first, you must be last. In order to be the greatest, you must be servant. Think about this. There's no higher position than that of God. I think we would all agree on that statement that if you are God, you've made it. You are now at the top. You are top dog, so to speak. But Jesus, although being God, did not use his position as God to his own advantage, but rather he was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And this is the mindset that we, his followers, his children, the blood bought, the saints, his body, we are the body of Christ. We are to have the same mindset that Jesus had. Because understand this, Death on a cross was an excruciating, extremely terrible thing to, to experience. It was excruciating pain and it was degrading. The agonizing suffering, suffering and humiliation is indescribable. Yet Jesus 
being creator God, made himself a servant. For he said that he did not come to, to, to be served, but to serve. He came to be a servant, the lowest on the totem pole. And he did it all for us. Listen to this. One day, the disciples were arguing about who would sit on Jesus' right hand or on his left. It was all about what's in it for me. That's what they were thinking about. They wanted to know who would be greatest in the kingdom. They were thinking titles, positions, power, supremacy. Look at, uh, at Jesus' response to their argument and debate. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 through 28. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And there it is. Jesus chose to lower himself and to come as a servant in order to give his life as a ransom for all of us. For you and for me, for your family and for my family. Whomsoever will, let him or her come and drink freely from the living water of life that Jesus is freely offering. Come, drink of that water and live forever. That is why Jesus came as a servant, that he might have preeminence amongst his brothers. But we want reward without works. We want titles without intimacy with the title giver. We want victories without battles. We want distinctions without depriving ourselves. We want to be heard without talking to God. We want a great name without servanthood. We want to be first without first being last. How can we receive greatness in the kingdom without first servant. We have to be servants. We must be servants. What has happened is we have brought Price's Law into the church. Price's Law is a law created by Derek J. D. Sola Price, which states, and I want to quote, the square root of the number of people in a domain do 50% of the work. This means that in a company of 10 employees, three of them do half of the work. The remaining 50% of the work is done by the other seven people. This scales too. When there are 100 employees, 10 of them do half the work. The other 90% are doing the other half of the work. As your company grows, incompetence grows exponentially, and competence grows linearly, end of quote. That means that as a company grows, the number of people not helping to pull the weight or the full weight grow by leaps and bounds, while those who are doing the majority of the work grows very slowly. Why is this? I believe it is from the lack of proper training and not putting people in the position that incorporates their natural abilities. I want you to notice that I did not just say training. Every company has training, but the key here is proper training and ongoing proper training. And in the church, it seems to be even worse. Apparently, there's an infamous 90-10 rule that states that 90% of the work will be done by 10% of the people. And to a certain extent, I believe it. I was a youth pastor in a certain church who had no children and no young people. I volunteered to come and build a youth um, program for them. 
on my own time and at my own expense. The church ran about 30 to 40 elderly people on a good Sunday. But before canvassing the neighborhood that the church was in, I asked the church to fast with me and my family for three days. Only two older women showed up. Not even the pastor nor his wife came out in support. The problem in the church today, I believe, is the lack of discipleship, which leads to a lack of ownership, which results in a lack of commitment. There's no commitment in the church because there's no ownership in the church, which stemmed from the lack of discipleship. It all comes down or comes back to discipleship or the lack of discipleship in the church. There should be very few, very little, or maybe no job advertisement for positions of pastor or worship leader. Why? Because they should all be raised up from within the congregation. Are you telling me that there are no capable people in your church to be discipled and trained to take those positions? I would say there are. Nowhere in scripture can we find Jesus telling us to go and make converts, but instead he commanded us to go and make disciples. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We are not commanded to go and build mega churches. But I believe they're necessary. I believe we need the mega churches. I believe that mega churches are a result of doing what we're told to do. Because Jesus, God will add to you daily if you do what it is, if you preach what it is that he's commanded you. We're not commanded to even go out and save people because that is not our job. That is the job of the Holy Spirit, to draw convicted hearts to Jesus and give who, who, who in turn, Jesus in turn, gives his salvation to any and to all who willingly come. What we're commanded to do is to make disciples by teaching them Jesus' commands, what he commanded us to do. And one of the greatest commandments is to love, to love one another. There's very little discipling going on in the church these days. Our choir members are shacking up in immoral relationships. Our worship leaders are leaving their wives for younger and maybe even prettier in women in, in, in their estimate. Our pastors are caught up in illicit sexual affairs. The church is a real mess because there is no discipleship going on. I believe discipleship begins with praying for your people and ending with giving them ongoing hands-on training. It does not matter how well a convert seems to be doing. That con convert will need more in-depth training at some point in his life or her life. Look at chap Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 26. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Although Apollos was eloquent and competent in the scriptures, he was 
fervent in spirit and taught accurately and boldly the resurrection of Jesus. Still, Priscilla and Aquila found it necessary to take Apollos aside and to disciple him and to teach him in more accurate way. They were not jealous of his talent. They were not threatened by his eloquence. They weren't even taken back by his boldness. But they saw Apollos as a fellow worker and one in need of a little more discipline. So what did they do? They took him aside and they taught him. They discipled Apollos. But also notice that Apollos was not insulted by their interest in him. He was not insulted or taken back by them taking him under their wing, so to speak, and to teach him, to give him time, to spend time with him, to teach him a more accurate way, to teach him the more in-depth things of the Spirit. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 20, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. We are all a part of the one body, the body of Christ. And we all have a part to play. And we all have a job to do in that body. We are no longer individual members, but members of the body of Christ. And each member is needed in order to make the body function properly. And if there were no eyes, how could the body see? Or if it were, had no ear, how could the body hear? The sea with legs and arms. And that is what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints, that is, to disciple the saints, to disciple the believers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Paul said that Jesus gave us the five-fold ministry to build up the body of Christ. To what end? So that we all attain the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, and that we all reach maturity to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. We are not to stay infants drinking spiritual milk, but we must all grow in, in maturity. We must all grow to soul-winning spiritual adults. Peter said it this way, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. 
We're not to be bench warmers. We're not just to stay idle and let somebody else do all the work, do all of the praying, do all of the discipling, do all of the intercessory. We are a part of the body. We need to act as part of the body. We need to be a part of the body. We're to use our gifts to serve one another. And each one of us has a gift that we are to share, that we're to use in service. Remember the story of Moses in the desert. Exodus chapter 18 records a rather interesting discourse, conversation between Moses and his father-in-law. Exodus chapter 18, verse 13 through 14. It says, the next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning until evening? So Moses began to explain to his father-in-law what it was that he was doing. It was like, when the people come and they have disputes, they come to me and I hear their case. And I tell them what God's laws and what God's statutes are. Then I will decide the case based on the knowledge that I have of God's laws and God's statutes. But that is not what Jethro, his father-in-law, was asking. His father-in-law saw all that, that he, he did. He saw all and heard all that was going on. He knew what Moses was doing, so that was not what he was asking. He saw exactly what was going on that day. What he was really asking is, what are you doing? That thing that you're doing, that is not a good thing. That is not very effective because you alone are carrying the full load with no one to help you bear that heavy burden. You will soon wear yourself out and you will also wear the people out, the people that you are serving. Then he gave him this advice in Exodus chapter 18, verse 19 through 23. Jethro tells Moses, his son-in-law, now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God and you shall warn them about the statues and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, this is called discipleship. Moreover, look for able men from all the people Men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe. And play such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you. But in a small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all the people also will go to their place in peace. What Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, was actually advising him to do was to disciple people, train workers who could and would help bear the heavy, heavy burden because it was much, much too heavy for one person. Even for Moses, it was much too heavy for him to bear alone. In Numbers chapter 11, God tells Moses to choose 70 elders and bring them to the tent of meeting. And he, God himself, would put the spirit that was on Moses. He would put it on those 70 elders and they would help him carry that heavy burden. It is, it is not all about us. It is not about us shining and us being the shining star and the go-to person. It's about working together as a body. We're, we're to work together, we're to serve each other. 
It's about sharing the heavy burden. Help bear the heavy load. Work with each other. Through proper training and discipleship, we can make the load lighter. We can make it easier to bear. We can get and keep more converts, more disciples. People must be properly trained and discipled if the church is going to grow and going to continue to exist. That is why there is so much falling away in the church today. The people are not sharing the burden, but it all begins with salvation. We must first be saved. We must first come to Jesus. We must first repent. We must first accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. So let me ask you, are you saved? Do you know Jesus as your own personal Savior? If you do not know Jesus as your own personal Savior, but you would like to know Jesus as your own personal Savior, here is how. All you have to do is to repeat this prayer that I'm about to pray. And believe, and Jesus will accept it, and you will be saved. But maybe there's someone out there who do not understand our terminology when we say being saved. Well, here it is in a nutshell. Jesus died on the cross in our place. We were, we were the ones who were condemned. But Jesus took that and all, the, all our sins were placed upon Jesus and he bore it. He paid the price, which is death. And he died on the cross that we might live. Now on the third day, he rose to life and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he's offering this free life, salvation, because he purchased it with his own blood with his own death. He purchased life and he's offering it to you. He's offering it to me. So if you would like to have this life and live forever, just repeat this prayer with me and believe it in your heart. Dear Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. Help me to be discipled. Help me to submit to discipleship that I might help bear the burdens of the church, that I might be a worker in the church, that I might take my rightful place as in the body of Christ, whatever my position is, whatever you have called me to be. Thank you for forgiving me, Jesus. I accept your free gift of life. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do now is to find a Bible-believing church and be discipled in that church. Learn how to pray. Learn how to read and study your, the, the Bibles, the scriptures. Learn to live those scriptures. Learn to love. Learn to forgive. Maybe you've been hurt. Forgive. Just like Jesus forgave you. Then what I want you to do is to get a Bible. Whether it's off your shelf or you have to go out and buy one. Get a Bible and read the Bible. Highlight the Bible. Highlight scriptures. Read it every single day. Hide those those verses away in your heart that you might not sin against God. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should, should be doing, winning souls. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.